Hello. Hi, good evening. You are so punctual. I'm very impressed. Like right at 11, just like me. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Lucky you guys. We have some, you, you have the sun on that side. We're freezing. Is, oh, that's right. I, you know, I always forget when I talk to people in the Southern Hemisphere that it's opposite, you know, your har harvest. I, I can't even keep it straight. Um, so yeah, we, yeah, we're now in winter and it's just freezingly cold. Um, like I, last week we've got, we had ice, we had, yeah, we had snow, we had all the things you can think of for winter. Is it a tough? And so, yeah. Sorry? Is it a more extreme winter t this year? For me, it feels like, yeah. but I I know that it's still it's still the norm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's the norm, but it's like I'm not a winter fan, but it's um, I can say that it's a good winter actually for for the vineyards. It's raining, oh. it's cold, so it's it's perfect for the wind vineyards, not for me. So <laughs> that's yes. we have to adapt to the vines. Um, well, can we back up? And I want to start by introduce yourself. I don't know how to pronounce your name. I've learned how to spell it, but. Could you pronounce your name for me? And then tell us your story, because you have a very fascinating uh, story with getting into wine. Uh, my name is Nsiki. I think you're going to need to try that, or I can give you the long version that you can try and pronounce. I'm okay with Nsiki. Is that okay? You're fine with that. You don't say <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, I don't know how much you know, but... Um, I'm from Wazulu Natal, uh, which is a, I'm going to call it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a province, generally say it's a province with a surname, but we have, vin, we have um, sugar cane there. We've got uh, avocados, like the avocado that is big, like the kid's chart, kid's head. So that's how big our avocados are. <laughs> um, so we've got that. Um, yeah, it's more, it's a, it's a tropical place, tropical area, beautiful um, area. Uh, but I grew up in a village called Wavotela with my grandmother and my siblings. And I went to school there, finished studying, applied for bursaries, no luck, and um, worked for a year as a domestic worker and then basically got a scholarship when I got recruited by South African Airways to study winemaking in Stellenbosch. So that's how basically I ended up in Stellenbosch. It was like oh yeah, here's a scholarship, you know, when you've been applying and you can't get funding and then all of a sudden there's funding saying, but you're going to be studying winemaking and you're like, oh yeah, sure, cool. Let's get along. Let's go. So, so why yeah. kind of picked you? Yes, it definitely did that. It, it picked me and um, I think I remember when we, when I had an interview with SAA, they were like, do you know that it's in Afrikaans? And I was like, oh yeah, sure, I'll learn. You know, it was taking things lightly um, until you get there. But at the same time, I had a conversation with someone at some point. She, she said to me, you can never be prepared for the experience. So I know even if I can say I knew it was Afrikaans, even though I didn't understand it, I, I, you know, I don't think I would have ever been prepared for the experience. Yeah. So, yeah. And kind of going in over your head, it makes you work harder. And you, sir, I did this when I went to France. I got in over my head with the language and it makes you work. You have to survive. So you just do it. That, yes, you're on a survival mode. And yeah. you, you're you like, I have to get this done. I have to. I cannot go back. I must get this. You know, it, it's one of those. Then it becomes a drive because you must have it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So one of the things that struck me, I've, I've been reading the, the interviews that I find with you online and I posted them in my stories and I encourage people, I always put the URL so people can track down the story and read because they're very interesting. But your grandmother figures very heavily in your history and the name of the wine. But you mentioned that she was, she, she would take 50 cents and turn it into 100,000. She was an entrepreneur. And I feel like I read that you said you wanted to make wine, not just the be a winemaker but you wanted to have your own business and did do you see yourself as an entrepreneur or did you grow into that i think i don't know if i saw myself as one but i know that when i was a student i wanted to have my own business um if i were to track it back to high school and primary school i was selling sweets at school 
or selling biscuits. So I don't know if that counts as, but um, I remember when I was in primary school, when the school, during the school holidays, I'll go to town and sell fruits. And I bought actually my own uniform in standard five going to standard six. So, yeah. So basically I can say it was in the blood. Mm -hmm. um, just needed to be natured. And also that, that's basically that. And so when I was um, working, because while I was studying, I knew I wanted to start my own business at some point. So when I was working at Stilekaya, my way of working, it was more like, there was no job, there was no department that I was saying, this is not my job description. Anything that needed to be done, I will do it. And in that way, I learned all the aspects of the business. Yeah. And so it was more like now getting to start my own business, it was more like just gravitating to that and just growing into it. Do you, how so, yeah. do you that influenced you as a winemaker then? Sorry? How do you think that, or do you think that influenced you as a winemaker? Having the big picture of the business. Well, I think one of the thing is um, not forgetting because as winemaking, I think this is where the struggle I used to get actually with my previous job. As a winemaker and as a business person to balance the two, because as a winemaker, you're an artistic person, you are dealing with uh, nature, you are dealing with chemistry. So it's more like scientist um, and being an artist at the same time. But then now you have to think of the business. So I used to, I used to love because I'll come to my GM and I'm like, um, I need so many barrels, I need this, I need that. And, you know, and then she'll look at me and she says, so where is that money going to come from? I'm like, I don't know. That's what I need. <laughs> because what I needed, it means she must go work hard to yeah. sell, to be able to get me what I need. Yeah. You know, so now as a winemaker and a business person, you're like, oh, I need to work so hard. So this, I really, really want that. So I need to work hard on this side yeah. to be able to get that. But I'm, I'm, I'm <clears throat> grateful with the support structure that i have because they're making that possible yeah have you become a good salesperson because you have to then i i have many friends always say it's okay it's hard to make good wine it's really hard to sell the wine have you become good at that it's hard to sell the wine that's like if i can say selling a bottle of wine it's like i always say it's like you're busy looking for the teeth of the chicken so yeah <laughs> it's it's just it's 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 hard because you know rejection is so not nice <laughs> and sales people they take rejection with i don't know with pride or with i don't know but they no oh, it's like it's a norm it's like oh yeah no that's fine let's move along and you're like it hurts this is my wine i'm talking about you know so but i think for me when i talk to people i'm not talking to them to sell them wine Okay. That's not what I do. I don't sell them wine. I tell them about the wine. I enjoy the wine with them. And then it's up to the person whether they feel, actually, this will add value in yeah. their life. Yeah. So that's basically, I, I focus on what I know best, which is making wine, telling people about the winemaking, and then the person will make a decision whether they feel this will make their lifestyle fun. Yeah. That's... So, I, yeah. So much having a glass of wine either reminds you of the place or it reminds you of the person who made it. And it's almost hard to not like the wine of a person you like, or if you love the wine, you're going to love the person who made it. There's some weird metaphysical connection there. Definitely. Definitely. I, I think, I, I think when we talk about wine, um, I think as winemakers, we're very passionate about our wines. Mm -hmm. We love our wines. We, we drink it long before it gets to the market. By the time it gets to the market, you've already, you are halfway down, down drinking and enjoying the wine. So um, when you talk to the people about it, it's, it's your passion. It's your, you know, you're talking about your, your, your child, you know? Yeah. So I think one of the things I always notice that people, they, some, they wouldn't know, obviously the, the, what I'll call it. They wouldn't know the, 
the stressful moments that we go through before you get the wine to the market, before you get the wine into somebody's hands in their glass. Yeah. Because um, I'll make an example. Um, when uh, there was a, my 2018 Sauvignon Blanc, I've been a red winemaker my whole winemaking life. Okay. So what I did then is, because I've been a winemaker of the reds, and then I started making one, when I started as I started making white wine. 2018 Sauvignon Blanc made me say, what was I thinking? <laughs> and <laughs> it made me say that because... I remember um, because it was a it was a difficult year in general. Uh, it was just after the drought, and so the effect on the white wines, while the red wines were just beautiful, so the chemical components on the white wines were just a bit, um, you know, somehow not in good balance. Uh -huh. So, that day we did protein stabilization of the Sauvignon Blanc 2018, and I realized that, like something that usually go fast and quick and done. Yeah. It didn't happen. And now I needed to add more bentonite. And then the panic started. I'm thinking, it's going to strip the wine. This is going to happen. Now you're having all this conversation in the head and you're thinking, okay, how do I, like, I have to, I, like, I know I have to do it. Okay. Yeah. But the effects. And <laughs> I remember on, it was on a Friday when I was adding it for the second time. Over the weekend, I think it was on a Sunday, I dreamt the wine was tasting like water. <laughs> the stress, I woke up early in the morning on Monday, I ran to the cellar. I tasted the wine, I'm like, you know when you, you open the tap in the tank, you pour, and then you go, it still tastes like wine, okay. Like, it was, it was one of those. I think until the wine is in the bottle, it's somebody's enjoying it. We, you don't have peace. You like, I think you know, it's after that, don't you? When you send samples to a potential distributor or an agent or something, you start to kind of question, oh, I could have picked a day later or I could have used less of something. I think what, for me, the stress is when I have to open the first bottle. Okay. <laughs> the problem is with the first bottle after bottling, because during bottling, you are there on the line, you taste the wine, you're like, okay, fine, sign up, let's go. Yeah. Well, it's good. And then it's just literally a gap, a meter gap to the bottle and it goes to the other side. And then you start thinking, oh, it's in the bottle now. I need to open this bottle. Yeah. But then you're going to be opening it a few days later or a month later or whenever. But that first bottle. The first one. Okay. It's like, yes. That's because now you're like thinking, uh, hmm, I wonder how do you taste like? But I knew that when I was bottling, I was like, yes, you got Good to go. And then I was like, Ish, I wonder how you taste like. <laughs> so oh. that, that, yeah. So, um, example, I bottled the 20, well, that was the 2018 Chardonnay. I bottled on a Tuesday and on a Wednesday I had a meeting with my importer from Taiwan. Okay. Um, so we met at this restaurant in Cape Town. And so there was a sommelier. He always, so he's about to open the bottle. And I'm like, so I say to him, I just bottled this. I haven't tasted it myself and I'm coming to taste it with people. It's just, it's a nightmare. <laughs> and then, so he opens it, he tasted, he comes, he's like, oh my word, this is so beautiful. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm glad somebody likes it, but let's me taste and hear if I'm like, am I confident about it? Am I proud of it? Because uh -huh. at the end, it boils down to that. Yeah. So, and then I tasted it and I was like, Okay, because like that was the first bottle that I had to open. So it's um, I think once the wine has been in the bottle for a while, we start sending to to distrib potential distributors mm -hmm. after two or three months later. So the wine has settled at least, and right. you're like, okay, you know. But if you're gonna be sending, I think one of my distributors that I generally send wine sometimes just after bottling is Wine for the World in the U in New York. <laughs> she's the one that I, I actually generally like I'll finish bottling and I'm like okay pack and then send the wine through and then I'll be like the wine is sent but it doesn't mean drink it <laughs> so yeah but 
Yes. Um, so can you, so this she, is for, it. she, it, it was all fine, obviously, right? Everything was good. Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Can you give us, there's a lot of people who might be wine professionals, but some just wine lovers. Can you kind of give an overview of South African wine and then tell us why your wines might be different, why yours stand out? So if I talk about South African wines, um, I think one of the most beautiful things about South African wines, even though I feel somehow, it's only now that in the world we're being visible. Yeah. We've been really underrated and we have one of the most beautiful wines in the world. And the fact that our wine, when you taste it, you cannot really pin it to one space. Mm -hmm. It's just phenomenal because when you taste South African wine, you can pick up the characters of the old world wine styles. You can pick up the characters of the new world wine styles. And that combination is just, it's mind blowing. It's beautiful. Because you cannot, again, it's like you cannot pin us in one space. Mm -hmm. So for that, for me, that's what makes South African wines, I feel, the best. And so, what makes Aslina stand out? It's our passion. <laughs> Look, that's our been passion. here. <laughs> like, we love, we, we enjoy our wine. And, you know, we, we play with it. We, like, I, I call when we like, Blending is like you're playing, you know. When you're blending the wine, you're actually playing because you're busy pouring this and tasting, and you know, it's it's we love blending. I, I really enjoyed blending, I yeah. really enjoy blending so much so that even my Chardonnay, I'll say my Chardonnay is blended, it's cold climate and warm climate region. I yeah. blended the two because I wanted something different. Um, the Cabernet is not a hundred percent care, but I added a bit of Petit Vido in it, played around with the wine, and then I've got a Bordeaux blend and the Sauvignon Blanc. At some point, I also did the same thing to blend two two regions. So it's um, it's it's just enjoying what we do and understanding that what we enjoy, somebody out there is going to be crazy like us and enjoy it. Yeah, but don't I mean blending? I think. I've been at blending things and it's, it's so stressful and I think it's clear in your wine that you do enjoy it, but how do you, I mean, remain, keep that childlike uh, passion and fun sense of playing when you're blending because you know that your future success is, is dependent on doing it right. Well, I, I think when talking about doing it right, for me at the end of the day, it's all about the balance of the wine. Okay. You want your wine to be balanced. You want it to be elegant. You don't want, um, for us, for us linear wine, we want more, you must have the fruit. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we're using mostly second field barrels. We do have new, we, use, we do use new barrels, but we've got a small percentage of new barrels mm -hmm. because we just want more of the fruit and then it must get married. So for us, it's more like the balance. You want the balance of the wine and you want the elegance. And in terms of how do we balance that part that what we're enjoying the world is going to enjoy, one of the things we know, you cannot make everybody happy. That's true. So you can't make everybody happy. And two, you cannot present to somebody something you are not proud of. Mm -hmm. You cannot present somebody some, to somebody something you are not happy with. Because then yeah. what is it that's going to make them be excited and want to drink it with you? Right. You know? So um, I opened the bottle of 2018. I bottled it in February. And then Interesting enough, this is one bottle. This is the first one that actually got tasted by, drank by people before I could even open the first bottle. <laughs> because what happened, we were sold out completely on the 2017. Okay. And when we were bottling, we had to bottle and pack and ship immediately. Oh. And like, so, the, so I only opened it like, what, three weeks ago. And I was like, you know, I opened the glass, I took a sip, and then literally I, it's like I, I moved into it and I just relaxed with it because it just. That's awesome because it's kind of like sending your kid off to college and you're just like, oh, you're on your own now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Can, uh, my experience with South African cuisine is a, is a braai. And mm -hmm. 
you talk about maybe more than just that of what kind of food you eat in South Africa and how your wines go with that? So South Africa, we've got, sure, we've got a mixed pot of people. So in terms of culture, like we diverse. So because we diverse, there's so many cuisines. Um, I'm Zulu and I cook mostly my traditional food. Okay. So when it comes to what food do I do, like I like making dumplings. I like making chicken curry. I, and those are things that I cook and eat with my food. I would like to have pap and have um, tomato sauce, like tomato, uh, and have a piece of meat. And so those are things that I eat. Okay. And they work with wine. Yeah. They work with wine. So, um, yeah. So we've got like lots of different cuisines, really. What do you put with curry? I always think something that's like a full-bodied white, but I think you're saying the reds work too. The reds, this is one thing. I think when I, when I look back, um, when I was working at Stelikaya, um, people were like, no curry. Was, well, as a young winemaker, you listen when people say, no, you don't do this with that. So, you, you know. So this one day I made chicken curry. I, I cooked my curry with masala like my grandmother used to make it. So I made it, and for some interesting reason, I had opened a bottle of Merlot. Okay. I remember it was a Merlot in 2006. I opened a bottle of Merlot. I cooked, and then I literally had one spoon. I had a glass. When I took a sip, I put down, I took my phone, I called my colleague. It was Joe Quick, and I was like, you won't believe. I was like, this is just awesome. She was like, okay, whoa, 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 just calm down. What's going on? I was like, I just had Merlot with chicken curry. It's so good. <laughs> because I was doing something and I'm not expecting what I'm doing. And then, and then all of a sudden, and I was like, Whoa, I almost missed out. It was beautiful. And then you think of so, yeah. have that together, what you're, yeah, what you're missing out on. Just yes. Because I think again, we, it's one thing I also realize is that when you're doing, cause we cook curries in different ways. Mm -hmm. There is that slight sweetness in curry. Because of that slight yeah. sweetness, it works actually with red wine. But when I was in Japan last year, uh -huh. when I was in Japan last year, they make spicy noodles, something. I can't remember what was the dish, but it, it was noodles that were spicy. Okay. And it was so beautiful with cabinet. And I was like, yeah. But is it um, low tannin, more fruit? Cabernet and Merlot that these that these work. I think so because also when you look at when I look at my cab, my cab is very like soft and tannins. Okay. Actually, my wines, both reds, they are very soft and tannins. So yeah. Yeah, and then it uh, it the spice is kind of it's kind of like using the wine as a spice for the fruit because like people don't think, but black pepper makes strawberries taste better sometimes. So it's like that. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that's why I think when it comes to wine, one of the most fascinating things is like when it comes to wine, you cannot say things are set in stone. Yeah. You, you, just, you just cannot because you're dealing with nature. You're dealing with a living product. You're dealing with an ever-changing content. Mm -hmm. So as it changes, things happen. Life happens while you're busy watching it pass by. So that's what happened with the bottle. Yeah, and I think people do miss out because you think, oh, I couldn't have this Bordeaux with this dish with eggs or something. And then sometimes you come across it and it just works and it's, you, you don't always remain open to that. Um, yes, I think that's why it's good to experiment at home. Just do whatever. 100%. Um, how, what's going on with the quarantine in South Africa? Well, we, we are now on level three. So when we were on level five and four, we couldn't, okay, level five, we couldn't export, we couldn't sell wine, or there was no sales of liquor. Okay. Level four, somewhere in the middle of level four, we were allowed to export wines, but okay. still we couldn't sell locally. So there was no sale of liquor. So on level three, which started on the 1st of June, then we were allowed to sell liquor. Um, okay. But it's um, from Monday to Thursday. So, um, 
Yes, Monday to Thursday. So now they are talking about advanced level three, which I, is more like allowing more businesses to operate, to operate and also allows restaurants to have sit down, but obviously controlled in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So we're now moving towards that. But it's been, I think it's been, it's been hard on businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Hard on businesses. So I've, yeah. One of the things I've learned by talking to winemakers around the world is some wineries are very um, heavy on selling to restaurants and they're the ones that suffered the most. And the people, there's a lot of California wineries that have a third direct to consumer, a third retail and a third restaurant, and they seem to be doing the best. What is your, how are your customers uh, in that layout? Um, we are not much in restaurants locally. We basically it's been managing to get direct consumers. Okay. So it's been the trade and consumer. Okay. Because and- what had happened, we hadn't been, since we started, we only started last year to focus on the local market. So we're starting to build the local market. But building it was more on the consumer side, actually, and the trade. And we hadn't focused yet on the restaurants. Yeah. So, yeah. But your wines that are in the States are going to restaurants, I would assume, right? Yes, they go to restaurants and they go to the trade. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's all my questions. Do you have anything you want to say to people before we end? We're almost at the half hour mark, but anything you want to tell us? Um, hmm. Oh, somebody did ask about your production. How much wine do you make? <laughs> um, we are making currently on 36,000 bottles. Okay. Yeah, 136,000 bottles. And basically we're growing so that we can be able to, when, once, we, once we have our own winery, because it, it, it's impractical to have a winery at that volume, you can't, yeah. you can't run it. So we need to increase our volumes to be able to have, actually to be able to run a winery. Um, that's our hope that um, we will be able, Hopefully, we'll, soon we will be able to have a winery of our own. But we're currently renting spaces in different with another winery, collaborating with them so that we have a home where we're making the wine and blending and doing everything. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, now you have to say some closing remarks. <laughs> <laughs> um, closing remarks. Mm. Okay, I think um, what I can say that oh, thank you actually for supporting us to have us on your on your live. It's my video. pleasure. Um, the person who posted and, your email and your Instagram, I, I thank her, him, her. I can't remember who I spoke to, but thank it's, you. It's Stephanie. Yes, she's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I hope uh, if people can follow us on on our Instagram too, and those who are not following us, and all our social media platforms, so we can grow. And just support us. And yeah, so we can grow. Thank you. I'm so excited to um, know you. And this has been just such a pleasure. Your um, People were commenting in the, in the feed that your passion is infectious. And I'm sure it translates into the wine. So it's been a true pleasure to meet you. And it's been a, a lovely time chatting with you. You're a delight. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. You take care now. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.